Hey guys, here's your review on the uh, Places of the Dead lesson. Took a different approach this time. We didn't uh, really sit there and discuss, but instead we uh, took a journey. Took a journey following the journey of Paul in his vision, which was your homework reading. And I know it was a lot of information. Hopefully going through the journey a second time here, you can uh, catch more of what was covered and uh, maybe focus on some things that kind of stick out to you that you want to focus on. Um, but here's here's the map of the journey. So we started off in the third heaven at the gate of heaven. Uh, following Paul, he was then taken into the second heaven, onto the firmament. He saw multiple doors of heaven um, as he journeyed along the firmament. Then he came out of heaven and found himself in a place he was told was Oceanus. Um, then from there, he was taken to another place in the middle of the earth, which... He was told was paradise and then back up to heaven for a tour of the city, the new Jerusalem described in Revelation chapter 21. And then from there, he went to the bad places. He was taken out of creation, out into outer darkness and then down into hell. So that was Paul's journey and his vision. Uh, we went through that journey today and here we go. Here's a second trip through this journey. So starting off um, at the gates of heaven, he was told before he started this journey that he was going to be shown first the places of the just. Um, he started up in third heaven. This was right after he saw the uh, judgments and the death that we covered in uh, last week's lesson. And as he's about to exit heaven, he actually saw a door there of gold. Um, he said there was two columns of gold and golden letters uh, above the the gates or the two columns. So there's a picture of the uh, gate of heaven uh, coming from the vision of Paul. And while he was standing there in the gate of heaven in the 21st paragraph of his vision, he said he heard words that were not lawful for a man to speak. Um, later on, as we get in Revelation, you're going to see John also heard some words that he was told, do not write down what these words said. Um, so Paul was basically told, look, you can you can share anything you want in public. You can relate anything you want you see in this vision, but not these words. So we have no idea what Paul heard. We have no idea what John heard up there. Um, Paul expressed this in, in the New Testament, 2 Corinthians 12. He said, uh, I was caught up to paradise and I heard things so astounding. They cannot be expressed in words, things no human is allowed to tell. So what, what this is that he heard at the gates of heaven, we have no clue. It is a mystery. It's a secret that's kept from us. And perhaps we'll hear it once we get up there. Okay, after that, he was led out of the third heaven, um, down into the second heaven, onto something called the firmament. He saw different multiple doors of heaven. Looks like to go in and out of heaven. And he went out one of those doors, and in the 21st paragraph, he said when he went out, he found himself over what looked like a ocean. And he was told this is Oceanus. Um, Oceanus in the Greek was believed to be the ocean that surround uh, the world. On the left picture there, you see the Greek concept of the world during the time of Paul. Um, they were not aware of like North America, South America, all of that yet hadn't been discovered. So to them, it was just what you see there, Europe, Asia, Africa, the Middle Sea or the Mediterranean Sea. And then outside of that was just water. That was believed to be uh, the ends of the earth. Um, the picture on the right is a picture from above the North Pole. If uh, you were to be floating above the North Pole and look straight down on the earth, that's kind of what you'll see. You'll see all the continents. Um, and you can see that it kind of does look like there's an ocean that goes around the earth. So Paul finds himself out of heaven, back in the earth realm, and he's above the ocean. And oh yeah, and we talked about the ancient Hebrew concept of the universe. Um, this was the concept of the universe that Paul had, um, that all the people during the time of Jesus had. Actually, in history, this is how the world was seen until we got into the Renaissance. And we came up with the globe theory and uh, the world is a globe and, you know, all that stuff with uh, Galileo and Isaac Newton and all those guys. But before that, this was the concept of the universe. Uh, so when Paul 
gave his vision, this is how he conceived the universe to be. Um, in his journey, you could see he, he mentioned the third heaven. Uh, the idea was the first heaven was the air above the earth, the sky, right? What we would call the atmosphere. Uh, second heaven was space. And then third heaven is beyond space, above space, where God dwells, the heaven of heavens. So Paul was first taken up there. He saw the judgments. And then from there, he exited down into the second heaven. Um, the firmament you see in the picture there is believed to be a hard structure at the end of space, um, separating the end of space uh, to heaven above it. Um, so the word, if you go into the meaning of it, actually means for a hard structure, firmament. And there's believed to be water above the firmament and water below in reference to the second day of creation in Genesis chapter one. So Paul goes along the firmament there. He sees multiple doors. He exits uh, one of those doors or through one of those doors and finds himself back in earth over the ocean of the outer ocean. And there his journey continues. Um, he said he went out of heaven. He knew he was outside of heaven. And then he was then taken to what he was told was the land of promise. And he was told that that place, that next place he was taken to, the land of promise, is where souls of the just go after they leave their body. So when they have gone out of the body, they're meanwhile dismissed to this place. Um, you can remember when Jesus was on the cross and the thief next to him uh, confessed his belief in Christ uh, by asking him to take him to his kingdom. Jesus told them, I assure you today, you will be with me in paradise. That man died that day. They broke his legs. He suffocated under the crucifixion and he died that day. And according to Jesus' words, that day he was in paradise. So could it be this land of promise that Paul is seeing and told this is where the souls of the just are meanwhile dismissed after they leave their body? Could that be paradise? Um, and what is paradise? So Paul is there. He's in this land. He describes it as um beautiful there's diverse trees fruits he says there's a river of milk and honey um that's kind of cool so something like kind of looks like that picture right there um is the idea of this place called paradise um where the just go after they leave their body um introduce you to a new book uh the book of enoch so goes back to the character of enoch if you just uh kind of review of who Enoch was in Genesis chapter five, the chapter on the genealogies from um, Adam, pretty much all the way up to Noah. Um, in the middle of there, there's one of these sentences, a man by Enoch. Now this is usually one of the chapters people skip over because it's just so-and-so lived this many years, had this son, and then lived this many more years, died. And then the next verse is like, and then his son's name was this, he had this son, and it just goes through the genealogy, um, you know, throughout. So you, people tend to just kind of be like, oh, and skip that chapter. Well, in the middle of it, when it gets to Enoch, Enoch is different from everybody else. Um, it, the, he starts off, it starts off with the normal, okay, Enoch was 65 years old. He became the father of Methuselah. Um, he lived another 300 years. But the part that's different about Enoch's uh, description is that it says Enoch lived 365 years walking in close fellowship with God then one day he disappeared because God took him and then it just goes on to the to Methuselah to the next guy and it's like oh what wait a second what did that just say he disappeared one day because God took him didn't say that for anybody else um so there's a book out there called the book of Enoch uh if you read it so the story goes Enoch was taken um for a year he was taken up to the third heaven like Paul was. He was given the tour of all the places, just like Paul was later on. And after a year, he came back and uh, dictated everything he saw to his son, Methuselah. Um, it was then written down on a book. Uh, Methuselah ended up passing it to his grandson, Noah, who took it through the ark um, into the post-flood world, passed on to Shem. Um, and then kind of hard to track the book after that, but... Seems to be it goes through, you know, to the Elijah had access to it. So you get into like the order of Melchizedek and the school of the prophets and the Essenes. Um, kind of an interesting uh, rabbit hole to dive into. I'm currently 
diving into it to uh, learn more. Um, but anyways, the Essenes end up, this group, the Essenes end up burying this in the, where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found back in the, in the 40s, not too long ago. And when the Dead Sea Scrolls were found amongst many Old Testament scrolls, here was the Scroll of Enoch, the Book of Enoch. Um, Book of Enoch, if you look, uh, research more on the history, it actually was canon. It was in the Bible until 4th century BC or AD, sorry, uh, year 300 and something. I forgot exactly um, and what the Pope's name was, but there was a Pope that basically ordered the Book of Enoch be taken out of the canon. Um, it was to be burned. It was heresy. Um, and I think it was because it talked a lot about fallen angels and stuff like that and the Nephilim. Um, so it was taken out. However, there's one church, the uh, Ethiopian church, that did not remove the Book of Enoch. And even to this day, they still have the Book of Enoch in their canonized Bible. Um, it was discovered and translated to English. It's open to the public now. It's digital. It was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, it's endorsed by the Bible. Jude, in his crazy little book, um, quotes in two verses straight from, quotes straight from Enoch. Um, Peter refers to it. So there's definitely a endorsement in the Bible for the book of Enoch. Um, during that time of Jesus, people knew of this book. Um, they were aware of it and its teaching. Um, so there you go. Quick, quick and dirty uh, intro to the book of Enoch. Um, but for this, we focused on Enoch's journey to these same places that Paul journeyed through. So Enoch journeyed through uh, paradise. He was told that, or he said that it was in the middle of the earth. Now, I don't know what that means. That's some kind of interdimensional thing, middle of the earth, or is it physically a place on earth in the middle? Um, don't know. Uh, if you're looking at the earth in that picture earlier from the top, from the North Pole, the middle would be the North Pole. Is it there? I don't know. Is it somewhere else in Israel? Not sure, uh, but Enoch did say it was in the middle of the earth. Um, and he said he saw a blessed place where there were trees and blooming, kind of like what Paul saw. Um, what Enoch added that Paul then mentioned was about this holy mountain that was also there. Now, uh, for the next lesson, we're going to focus on the enemy and talk about Satan. Um, so we'll talk more about Isaiah chapter 14. But this one verse I wanted to put there. Um, but when, when Satan rebelled, the, what he wanted to do was he wanted to ascend to heaven and set his throne above God's stars. And he wanted to preside on this mountain of the gods far away in the north. That's found in Isaiah chapter 14 in the Old Testament. Um, so I wondered, what is this mountain? You know, is there a mountain far away in the north? Is it a, the holy mountain Enoch is describing, describing paradise? Um you remember when Satan tempted Jesus, he took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kings of the world. I mean, how high is this mountain that you can see all the kingdoms of the world? Um, again, is it an interdimensional thing that we can't see? All things uh, that I ponder on this holy mountain. So give, give it some thought. Maybe when you're lying in bed tonight, you can't fall asleep. Think about it. Um, shared with you guys the... Mercator map of the North Pole. Uh, Mercator was known for making a lot of maps um, from uh, of the world. Uh, this is a this is a picture of the map he made of the North Pole. Now notice it's not all ice caps and stuff like it is now or we think it is now. I don't know. I don't know a question now. Who knows? Um, but wait, Mercator made this map of the North Pole. Um, he showed that there was four kind of four uh, land masses and in the middle there was a kind of what seemed like a whirlpool and a big mountain in the middle of the whirlpool. He described the mountain as a, he called it a Neda, which is like a black ore type, uh, magnetic ore type mountain. And there was four rivers that branched off of that and it's divided the lands, a land to the east, south, um, west, and north. You can see in the map on the left, there's the North Pole, um, the big mass to the left side there, the pink, that would be Canada. You got Russia on the right, Asia, um, the Norwegians there, um, you know, Iceland, Greenland, all that to kind of give you a picture of where Mercator put um, 
this North Pole and how he described it on his map. So interesting. It looks a lot different than how we see it on the map today. So I don't know what that means. But there you go. So could it be that this paradise is in the middle of the Earth in the North Pole? Um, what's interesting about that is as Enoch was journeying through this paradise, um, he was told that he saw a garden there and he was said that's the garden of righteousness or what we know as the garden of Eden. Um, in the garden, he saw the tree of wisdom and the angel that was guiding him was Raphael, one of the archangels. And he's the one who told him these things, how that's the tree that Adam and Eve, your, your father and aged mother, sin by eating from that tree and he was he he admired the tree and he was even given description on it and this is uh there in paradise so could it be that paradise the garden of eden is located in paradise uh, remember from uh, genesis chapter 2 uh, the garden was described as having a lots lots of beautiful trees you had the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you had the tree of life in the garden um Adam and Eve got kicked out of the garden when they sinned, and God stationed a cherubim to block the way to the tree of life. Why would he put that cherubim there if it wasn't that Adam and Eve could possibly go back into the garden to that tree of life? Um, he guarded it there so that they would not have eternal life from eating from this tree. So it seems like the garden was still accessible physically anyways um, once Adam and Eve were kicked out of it. So I don't know. Is it a place on earth? Um, there's a question about, you know, is the Garden of Eden on earth or was it in heaven? Um, is paradise in heaven? Is it on earth? I don't know. Um, yes, no, I don't know. Is there some connection? Is, it, is there the dimensions into play here? I don't know. It's all cool things to ponder. Um, but what we get is from the journey of Enoch and Paul is that paradise, Garden of Eden, all kind of seem to be uh, the same place. Um, I told you Enoch got description of the trees, um, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, the tree of wisdom. He said it looks like the fir tree, which is interesting. That's a Christmas tree. Um, the tree of knowledge of good and evil is the bad tree. And it was like a Christmas tree according to Enoch's vision. So... Why do we have a Christmas tree associated with the birth of Christ? That doesn't make any sense. I don't know. Um, definitely a pagan thing. Anyways, um, it says the leaves were like the carob tree, so like the middle. So they had like different kind of leaves, not pine leaves. And this was cool. He said the fruit of it was like the cluster of the vine. Um, no, it's, in scripture, it doesn't say Adam ate an apple. It never says apple. I know that's the common, you know, thing that people think out there. It does in scripture just say it's a, he ate of the fruit of the tree. Um, Enoch in his vision says the fruit is like the cluster of the vine or kind of like grapes there in that right picture. So who knows? Maybe that is what the tree of knowledge of good and evil looks like. Um, he also saw the tree of life. Uh, he said that its fruits resemble the dates of a palm. There's a picture of the dates of a palm. So, And the tree of life gives eternal life, gives a... Uh, extended youth so you don't age so which is why god blocked the way uh, so adam and eve wouldn't eat from it and remain in their sinful state it was an act of grace um he was told no mortals permitted to touch it until the great judgment um and at the end apparently that tree of life he was told will be transplanted to the holy place to the temple of the lord so when jesus returns and he sets up his millennial kingdom that tree of life will be transported um, to his temple, which will be in Jerusalem. And we'll get into that when we get into the millennium and um, you know, the Jews that survive the tribulation and enter into the millennium. It looks like they'll have access to this tree so that they can live long lives on earth during the millennium. So uh, we'll talk about that when we get into that part of the class. Um, in paragraph 45, Paul was told straight out, um, this is called paradise. This is where Adam and Eve sinned. Um, from there, there were four rivers. Um, Genesis chapter 2 confirms this with the four branches of the river that flow out of Eden. So there you go. Could paradise be the Garden of Eden? Maybe. Ponder it. 
Moving on. Um, and if so, is the tree of knowledge of good and evil still there? Is the tree of life still there? Um, oh, one last point here about Mary. Yeah, so Paul, when he's there in paradise, he saw Mary, the mother of the Lord, and he even had a little interaction with her, and Mary Mary told him that, like, yeah, if I come to meet those who did the will of my son and my Lord. So it seems like, you know, they just die, and when they come out of their bodies, there's, they go to paradise. Today you'll be with me in paradise, and Mary likes to just welcome you and, you know, kind of thank you for following her son. So thought that was kind of cool. Um, there's the review. You can uh, dive more into it. Um, what exactly is paradise? How does it associate with uh, heaven and earth and so on? All right. After that, the next part, he went up from paradise to back up to heaven, to the third heaven, where he saw the city. He called it the city of Christ. Um, this is the city described in Revelation chapter 21. Now, it was interesting. Paul saw that there was a lake outside the city. Um, those that go into the city are those who are converted and repent, those who believe in Christ. And it says, Michael, when you get up there, baptizes you in this heavenly lake before you enter into the city. So that's kind of cool. It looks like you go through a heavenly baptism um, as well. And you enter the city to be alongside those who have never sinned. I don't know who those are who have never sinned. Um, perhaps babies. And the city of Christ, here he describes it in the 23rd paragraph. Um, he sees lots of angels. He says there's 12 walls, 12 towers, matching Revelation chapter 21 when John saw it. Uh, he saw the 12 gates, you know, the 12 angels, so on and so forth. So Paul sees the same city that John saw in his revelation. Um, Paul kind of gets a tour, quick tour of the city. Um, he sees there's trees before the city. So outside the city, there's trees and, you know, grass and all that. Um, the idea of heaven being clouds and babies with wings and we're playing harps for eternity, which sounds boring in my opinion, is not biblically true. I, knew, I know this is not scripture, but even in the Bible we saw in Revelation 21, how it's described as that city. So... Don't know where the whole concept of the bouncing on clouds thing comes from. Um, but Paul's given this tour of the city. Um, he sees people that are outside the city. So these are people in heaven, but they're not allowed into the city. Um, he asks why. It kind of puzzles him as it puzzles me as well. Um, it says that later on, though, they will be allowed into the city as saints pray for them. And, uh, you know, the Lord uh, kind of forgives them. So it's kind of interesting. Could it be some people go to heaven, but they're not allowed into the city? Um, only those that truthfully follow Christ. Um, you remember the parable from Christ that uh, many who followed him were knocking on the door saying, Lord, we prophesied in your name. We did this in your name. And he's like, get away. I, I don't, I never knew you. So I don't know. Um, continuing his tour of the city. Um, in the next four paragraphs, Paul sees four rivers inside the city in heaven. He sees a river of honey, um, which he's told that's that section is for all the prophets, those who have afflicted their soul and not done their own will because of God. Sounds like people who just dedicate their life to ministry, um, maybe, uh, you know, like pastors and ministers and so on and so forth. Um, second one he saw was the river of milk. And I love this one, especially... Uh, with my daughter Zadie being up there, um, he sees infants, infants, and all those who keep who keep their chastity with purity. Um, this is also backed up by Jim Woodford's testimony of his near death experience when he was in heaven for 11 hours. He was also saw an area that he was told was kind of like a nursery for uh, the babies that have died. So, warm place in my heart for the river of milk. Um, truly believe my my daughter Zadie is uh, living up there right now. Um, River of Wine, that place sounds cool. Sounds like somewhere I want to go. Um, it says uh, those are all those who are receivers of pilgrims. So those who uh, practice hospitality and are hospitable to uh, other people. Um, your reward up there is River of Wine. And then River of Oil, those who will devote themselves to God their whole lives. And they'll take pride in themselves. The humble, those that follow God fully with all their heart. So there you go, Paul's tour of the city in heaven. 
Um, he saw golden thrones uh, placed at each gate. And what was cool about the thrones is he was told those are for those who, you know, are not. Let me see how I say it. Um, those that don't have understanding of heart and made themselves fools for the sake of the Lord God. They didn't, they're not experts in scripture or in the Psalms. Um, maybe they just only know one chapter, but that is enough for them to have full uh, zeal for the Lord and uh, just strong faith without having all the knowledge. Um, also said, describes those of the unlearned. So, you know, I thought about how about those with, uh, you know, um, mental disabilities, the inability to learn the scriptures, but they just have a strong faith. You know, these are the ones that are going to be placed in thrones up in heaven. So, so just of God to do something like that. Um, so keep that in mind. You know, if you see uh, someone with special needs or someone who has a mental disability or any kind of, you know, issue, think as you look at that person, like he or she will be on a throne in heaven, ruling in the city of heaven, uh, ruling over me. So, you know, give them a little bit of respect, give them a hug. Um, they're definitely... God will justify what they're going through and um, they will be placed in positions of authority, which I think is awesome. Um, he saw that they worship in the city. David leads the worship, he said, or he was told. Um, he was told the meaning of hallelujah, how it means let us all bless him together. He was also told that if someone ever sings hallelujah and those present do not sing or respond at the same time, that they commit sin because they do not respond. Think about that. Next time you hear in worship, hallelujah, or someone says hallelujah. After reading that, I always respond with hallelujah as well. If it means let us bless him together and you just stay quiet and ignore it, you're not blessing him. And it's angel tells Paul that's actually considered a sin. So next time you hear hallelujah, respond with hallelujah or sing along in worship. Um, it was then taken outside the city, again, trees outside the city. He saw a river of milk and honey, which is interesting because that's also what was in paradise. So is there some kind of connection there um, between heaven and paradise? Um, some kind of interdimensional connection, maybe. Um, he saw an ocean, which supports the foundation of the heavens. Um, I don't know if this is the ocean outside. It seems like to be supporting the foundations. Or also, is there an ocean in heaven? Um Again, I referred to a little earlier, Genesis 1, how on the second day, he made a space between the waters to separate the waters from the heavens, from the waters of the earth. Um, the New King James Version calls it the firmament, and the firmament blocking the waters above from the waters that are below. So maybe there is an ocean up there in heaven. Um, there's the picture that I was just uh, talking about of the ancient Hebrew concept of the universe. Uh, with the waters above the firmament and also the waters below. Um, Enoch's journey through heaven, he was taken off the earth, sat down up there. Um, what Enoch tells us was cool that Paul didn't see is what are the people doing up there in heaven? Um, so we know the definition of a saint is a person that is up there in heaven after they die. Enoch says that they are petitioning and interceding and praying for the children of men. So that's cool. Um, you know, I, I think the teaching of us praying to saints is a backwards thing. Uh, we do not pray to saints. We pray only to the Lord Jesus. Um, it's actually the other way around. Uh, the saints in heaven um, intercede for us. They pray for us. doesn't mean we pray to them, but they pray for us. Um, so that's kind of cool. That's kind of what your actions in heaven, which makes me wonder, you know, your loved ones that are in heaven, if they're interceding for you, do they know what's going on in your life? Are they watching over you? Um, as a lot of ancient traditions uh, believe that our, you know, our ancestors watch over us, perhaps they do from heaven. That's what they do. They watch over us and they constantly intercede on our behalf and pray for us. So good to know. I got my, uh, my daughter, it's got my corner up there. Probably keep her busy. Um, he also saw how there's so many, multitude beyond numbers, um, mansions all over the city for the elect and the holy. 
um, but many are not allowed to abide. Um, you remember in John chapter 14, Jesus says there's more than enough room up there in heaven um, for many to come. In the King James Version, it says, uh, my father's house, there are many mansions. So if you don't get a mansion here in this life, don't worry, you'll get one up there and it'll be way better. Um, he then finds himself again over the ocean that surrounds around the earth. But this time, instead of coming into the middle of the earth to paradise, he goes to the outer limit of the ocean. And it seems like he kind of leaves the realm of earth. Um, and he finds him, himself in a place where there's no light, only darkness, sorrow, and sadness. Um, so if this is the concept of the universe, this would be somewhere outside of it, where there's just darkness. Um, so I, I believe, I think this is what Jesus was referring to. Um, the place called Outer Darkness, where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth in uh, the book of Matthew in different parables. There's a place where you're just kicked out and uh, there's you're just outside and there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Um, Paul said that the people there are the ones that are either, neither hot nor cold. Um, so they're believers, but they're kind of the lukewarm type believers. Um, they spend some of their life on earth in prayer, but others in sins and fornication. They're kind of like not one or the other, you know. They're kind of just in the middle somewhere. Um, could these be the people that get up there to heaven? Because they believe in Jesus. Jesus died on the cross for my sins, right? He resurrected from the dead. They believe it. But then they also they live their life kind of like, yeah, I believe it, but it doesn't really affect their lives. Could it be those are the ones that when you get up there, Jesus says, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who breaks God's laws. See, Jesus doesn't just call us to believe. Um, even demons believe in him. Fallen angels believe. Satan believes in him. He calls us to follow. And I think outer darkness might be the place of those who believe but don't follow. Um, I mentioned in the last in the lesson about purgatory and that idea where believers you still go somewhere but you still gotta work out your salvation and you don't tend to make it to heaven until later on. Um, perhaps that's this place of outer darkness. I don't know. Um, I know I don't want to go there. It's not as bad as hell, but I don't want to go there. Um, I don't want Jesus to tell me I never knew you. Um, so not just believing, it's following. We are called to follow. Um, Enoch's journey through outer darkness, well, when he got to the ends of the earth, he saw seven mountains, and then beyond that, it was just darkness and a deep abyss. He said, beyond that abyss, I saw a place that had no firmament of heaven above, no founded earth beneath, there was no water, no birds, it was just waste. He did say he saw seven stars, though, um, out there, and he asked about them, um, and he said that they were in prison out there. Uh, which is interesting. It's almost like, uh, you know, even even stars could sin. I don't know. <laughs> so these seven stars were out there in outer darkness as a prison for the stars and the host of heaven. Um, who knows? Maybe stars have some kind of sentient being aspect to them. They're not just a ball of gas. Okay, the last part uh, to conclude, hell. Okay, so... Um, hell, the place below, right? We got Sheol, Gehenna, and the Lake of Fire. And I quickly go through each one of them. Um, Sheol, so Paul was then taken back to the north again. I don't know what the heck is it with the north, but he goes back to the north. And there in the north, he sees the great pits in depth. Um, he looks down in the pits. It's deep. He hears from the bottom of the pits people weeping and saying, have pity on us, O Lord, have pity on us, right? Um, and then he's told these are they who did not hope in the Lord, the ones who outright rejected Christ. They were thrown into the pit. Um, remember Luke 16, story of Lazarus, the rich man who rejected Christ. He can look up and see paradise. And he saw Abraham and Lazarus there. Remember, he said the same thing. Have some pity. Send Lazarus over here. Um, I'm in agony. So this pit that Paul's looking down into seems to be where if you reject Christ's sacrifice for you, this is where your soul is thrown 
um, after you die. Um, again, back to the ancient Hebrew concept of the universe. If you see there in the middle, like where it says Sheol, um, that is known, is believed, that is the underworld. The Greeks believe this too. They actually call it Hades, um, that it's literally below um, our ground. And this is scriptural. I mean, scripture, I showed you in the lesson, there's plenty of verses that describe this place, Sheol, as underneath our feet, um, below the ground. Um, it's also described as the abyss, because um, it goes down, down deep. Um, Paul, Paul says that if you're thrown into this pit, it, it takes you 50 years of falling before hitting the bottom. So it's a deep, deep, deep pit. Um, and those who are thrown in there are held there to work out, to suffer for their sins until the great judgment at the end of the age. Um, paragraph 34 through 40 summarized there talks about the different places in hell for different sins. So if you don't accept Christ's sacrifice for you, you are still responsible for the sins you do in your life. And down there in Sheol, there's different compartments, different places for different sins. Um, there's the list. Uh, you could read through it. You know, one of the ones that caught my interest were like false ministers. I would not want to be in that section. Or people that are involved in magic arts and witchcraft are down there. Um, same, <laughs> there's a spot down there for same uh, gender sex, um, abortion, right? Bringing forth infants from the wounds. So look, we are all guilty of all these sins that you see on this list. We fall into somewhere on that, on that list, right? Um, that is why Christ's sacrifice is so important. If you see yourself somewhere on this list, you have someone who paid for it. And you, by trusting in him, he takes the payment for it. If you don't, you're going down to Sheol and you're going to go pay for your sins until the great judgment. So I can't stress enough the importance of trusting in Christ's sacrifice. And then after you do that and you're saved from this place, then follow him if you want to be able to be in that city that's up there. Enoch also journeyed through Sheol. He saw four hollow places. Um, he's told how the different places are for like, you know, different judgments. And they're going to be there until the great judgment at the end of the age. Um, he asked why they separated from each other. Um, we saw... Three of them are for judgment, and then one is for the righteous. So interesting. Um, looks like he was back in paradise looking down at the pit just like, or the three pits, um, just like Paul did. And he's like, why is this section separate from those? It's like, oh, the righteous go here. Is that where Abraham and Lazarus uh, were? Um, maybe nobody can go up to heaven until after Christ's sacrifice, and everybody kind of stayed in paradise until waiting for Christ to come and complete his task. Um, Luke 16, you remember uh, the, the man or Abraham told the man at the bottom of the pit, he's like, there's a great chasm separating us. No one can cross over from here to there or there to here. Um, so from the pit, you can see paradise. From paradise, you can see the pit, but you can't cross over. Um, depend Where you end up depends on your, uh, your, I guess, where you stand with Christ. Highly recommend you go and read Jim Woodford's testimony. There's the link. I'll post it in the comments. I found him basically in a nutshell. Um, like I told you guys today, he died. He was not a believer, but with his dying breath, he yelled out, God, forgive me, please save me. And then he died. Um, he saw himself outside in his body. He saw his body in his car. He was then taken to paradise. He described paradise. While he was there, he saw the pit. And he felt like he was getting pulled towards the pit. Um, he can hear voices from the bottom of the pit. He saw like some kind of creature. He said it was scary. And then two angels came, got him, and he went up from paradise uh, to heaven. He saw the city. He was not allowed to enter it. He saw the, but he, he kind of was over it. He could see it. He saw the infant area, um, the, you know, the area around the river of milk where the babies are. And he saw Jesus, but he couldn't go up to Jesus. He recognized Jesus because of the wounds um, in his hands and on his feet, but he was not allowed to go to him though he wanted. He was told he had to go back. Then he felt himself fall back and he woke up 11 hours, 11 hours um, dead. 
and he shares his testimony. I highly recommend you uh, look it up and listen to it. It's a great testament to everything we just talked about today and how, you know, these places are real. This stuff is real. Um, it's not just some thought of thing. They are actual real places. Um, Gehenna talked about it in the lecture about a prison. Peter described it where um, angels were in prison until the final judgment. Um, these are the watchers before the flood. Uh, uh, Paul and his vision is shown that he's told that's hell. He, he doesn't go there, but he just sees what he describes as fiery masses glowing in every part. Um, Enoch as well. He doesn't go there, but he can see a great fire um, there that's as far as the abyss, way at the bottom. Um, he saw the sending columns of fire, and he was told also, this place is the prison of the angels, and here they will be imprisoned forever. In reference to the angels during his time, um, found in Genesis chapter 6, that had left their mandate and um, had mixed with women and created the Nephilim. I want that story going to uh, Genesis chapter 6 in the uh, Old Testament. And talk briefly about the lake of fire. Um, talked about it in the lesson, how this is known as the second death, the death for your soul. And it was a good question today, you know, does that mean your soul ceases to exist if thrown into this lake of fire? I don't know. Maybe it's a second death. Um, you know, it's probably going to be a painful experience if the first death of your body dying is painful. How much more your soul dying in this lake of fire? Um, but yeah, I don't know. Good question. When you're thrown there at the great judgment, do you in agony just slowly your soul dies and ceases to exist? Per perhaps, maybe. I don't want to find out. <laughs> okay, and then the last thing we ended with was this three-minute video. Um, I recommend again you pause, you watch this video again. There is the link uh, about the Cola Super Deep Borehole Project that they dug. This was out in the Russian area. They dug seven and a half mile deep and the, and the digging stopped because the temperature was so hot. And they put a microphone down there to see what they can hear. And they heard what sounded like people screaming um, for a few seconds before the microphone itself melted. Um, it was enough that the people doing the project stopped. They sealed that hole. Well, did it shut. It is shut to this day. And the project just ended. No one resumed it. The people in the area don't go anywhere near it. Um, it's believed that. You know, they dug all the way down into the pits and they can hear and they have the recorded sound bite, which is in this video that I recommend you watch again, share it with your friends, share it with anybody who's kind of gaffing off the idea of hell. Um, scary and sobering to hear the screams that are going on down there uh, below the ground that we walk on every day. I believe it's a real place. I believe it's down there. And uh Unfortunately and sadly, people are suffering down there for rejecting Christ. Okay, that concludes uh, the lesson. Next one, we're going to be uh, talking about the war. Not just the war going on now, but the war behind every war that's ever existed. Um, we're going to talk about our enemy, Satan and his forces. So I'll post that lecture on Sunday. Um, we're going to be referencing Revelation chapter 12 a lot, so you might want to read that chapter before we meet up, and we'll have the discussion on it next time we meet. Until then, God bless.